So welcome everybody to our uh, third webcast in the series of dealing with uh, Informix in some new ways, uh, specifically looking at the Internet of Things. Um, this webcast is focused specifically on ARM. Uh, hopefully it'll be useful regardless on if you're using ARM currently, you may not be an Informix user, or you're an Informix person and wanting to check out some of the new things out there, or just looking to see what some of the new features are at uh, in the Informix product. Uh, I'm Thomas Beebe with Advanced Data Tools, uh, so hopefully this is useful for you. Um, so Informix and ARM, it really is possibly the future of database management and data management. Um, we're going to go over what actually ARM is. A lot of people have heard the term. That I've talked to a number of people. They have a general idea about it, but they aren't really sure of the specifics. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about some of the common devices. How does this actually matter to you? What is relevant here? What can I use, you know, from this? We're going to talk a little bit about IBM, what they're doing with ARM, what they're looking at doing in the future, at least as much of it that I know of. Um, what makes Informix really well suited for ARM devices? That, that's one of the big questions is why should I look at using Informix over using one of the other databases out there? Um, and finally is what can you actually do with it? What, why does this meshing of Informix database product and ARM really work well together? So we're going to go into what is ARM. It's a risk-based chipset. They're specifically designed to be small, low power, low heat, and inexpensive. Um, you can go, uh, if you want to just buy a single ARM chip, you know, if you buy the latest Intel chip, you're looking at a couple hundred dollars. You buy the latest ARM chip, you're looking at a couple of dollars. Um, you can go buy them directly from manufacturers for a couple of dollars a piece. I'm sure if you're getting them in bulk, it's even cheaper. Um, it's not uh, the traditional x86 uh, architecture that many of us are familiar with, so you cannot just directly port applications over. It is a whole new chipset, a uh, whole new architecture set. Um, it runs on, there's a whole slew of Linux distributions that have been ported over to it, as well as a huge chunk of the Linux-based uh, software libraries on it. Um, there's BSD variants for it, there's Android on it. I've heard Windows is going to be coming out with an ARM port. Um, so most phones, tablets, and you know other small devices nowadays are an ARM. Most of us are carrying around an iPhone or an Android phone in our pocket. That's going to be running on an ARM chip. Um, the designs themselves, it's an interesting, you know, procedure of how these chips are done. Most of them, you know, the Intel, the AMD, they have, they own the intellectual property, they create the designs, they create, you know, how the chip is going to look, and then they have huge manufacturing plants to actually create the chips themselves, and then, then they sell them um, directly. For ARM, what they have is ARM Holdings, which is a UK company out of Cambridge, England, um, and they come up with the spec. They come up with the uh, the actual requirements of ARM. They come up with the ch how the chipset actually works. But then what they do is they lease it out to third-party companies who actually will go out and print the chips. And more than just printing, you know, a stock model chip, they put out because they put out the specs. These third-party companies, there's a huge number out there that are doing it now, um, mostly in Asia. They're actually producing, you know, computers on chip or they're introducing new features or making multi-core or adding things like, you know, a good example, quite a few of the chips now will come with high, uh, high resolution video encoding built into the chip itself. These aren't in the original specs. This is where the company goes out, takes the, you know, leases the, the spec from the ARM Holdings company and then produces something new based on it. So you, there's a huge variety of different chips out there. Um, you know, that are all largely uh, inexpensive and still low power, very low heat. So they're small. They're very small, the devices are. Um, at the bottom there, there are two devices and a uh, already used, so don't try to borrow the, the number, uh, pre, uh, rewards, you know, credit card there for size comparison. So those are full computers down there. And then, a, you know, a smartphone for uh, just a little more contrast. Um, you know, those small systems down there, and we'll talk about exactly what they are in a moment, those are running ARM chips. It's uh, running on it, that's a full computer, has everything that your desktop does, just a bit smaller, not quite as fast, and using way less power. 
So some common models. Uh, Raspberry Pi, um, many people have heard about this. This is the first one that really hit big for wide adoption. Um, the BeagleBone Black. This is another low-cost one, and we're going to go into some specifics, but that's a low-cost one. You'll find a lot of demonstrations used because it's a very nice little bit of hardware. It runs about 50 bucks. Um, the QB board and QB truck uh, are my personal preferences for doing something a little more power. And then you have your iPad, your iPhone, your Android phone, you know, most of the phones out there. Uh, there's a huge list of Chinese-based products um, that they've been putting out. All kinds of things from stuff that plugs into your TV to little mini uh, Android computers to little video game systems, all sorts of things that you can buy now that's all running on ARM. A huge number of TVs now are actually embedding the ARM chip directly into the TV itself to actually give you more of the, you know, they like to say the media TVs or the enhanced TVs. It's usually running an ARM chip under, under the covers. One of the ones you'll hear a lot about is specifically the Shasta Internet Gateway. We'll talk about it a bit more in detail, but it is a commercial product out there now running the ARM chip and running Informix on top of it. It's a very cool little product. So we're going to talk about the ARM versions. You'll hear quite a few of these tossed around, and there's three main releases um, right now that are actually out in production. The V6, uh, the original Raspberry Pi ran this, some of the older uh, – utilities run it. It works all right. They just ported Informix. So there is an Informix V6 model, but almost everything now is standardized on V7. Uh, the newer Raspberry Pis are on V7. The uh, Most of every other uh, devices we'll talk about today are. However, there's also the V8, which is just released, is just coming into adoption. It offers 64-bit support. It's a little bit faster. Uh, and for an example of what some of these companies are doing with it is there's a, a well-known company called All Winner. It's Chinese. They're one of the manufacturers, and they put out what they call their A-line. And there's A10, which is their single core, but they embed a actual 1080p GPU into the chip die itself. Uh, then they have the A2 lines, which is then dual core and A3 lines, which are quad core versions with higher definition video. All of those, they're V7 chips, but in the same size and really not a whole lot more money or power, they're now running multi-core and they're running it with uh, slightly higher clock speeds. So to actually show you what they look like, the Raspberry Pi, this is the granddaddy. You know, these have came launched at uh, $25 and $35, depending on how much RAM you wanted. Um, the very cool thing with them is they have a full HDMI port. They've got a SD card to actually run the operating system. They have the full uh, pin set there, which are all GPIO pins. So if you remember back, if you watched um, Mike Walker's talk on actually using sensors, you can actually use that GPIO to either hook into an Arduino or to actually hook sensors or a breadboard directly into your Raspberry Pi, and now you've got a full, not just a microcontroller, but you've got a full computer now talking to those devices. Um, it's also got, you know, the high-end audio out, multiple uh, USB ports, Ethernet port, uh, and also micro, uh, micro USB. It'll power either out through the micro USB or through a general power adapter, um, but you can run it directly off a of USB port. Um, if you're going out to buy this, and a lot, quite a few retail stores do carry this now, I know Fry's does, I know Micro Center does, and obviously Amazon. Um, there's two models. There's A and B. A is really meant for teaching environments. Um, it's quite a bit less RAM and a little bit more limited. And then there's the B models, which have a little bit more RAM, a few more a few more features such as network adapters. Um, I really recommend you get the B2. It's all. It's still $35. It just was released not too long ago. Um, I've got one running here. We'll do a demo on in a little bit. Um, the B2 has the higher amounts of RAM. It's nine, uh, 900 megahertz as opposed to 700, and you can overclock it. Um, it's also got a uh, it's dual core, and it goes on micro SD uh, as opposed to the traditional SD. Overall, it's a very nice piece of hardware. The original one had some issues with USB ports uh, having some cross-power problems. The new ones seem to fix that. It runs in Formix nicely. It is very small. You know, this is the one that's the size of a credit card. Um, and easy to find. It's quite easy to pick up and use. And one of my favorite things is because everything runs off that SD slot, 
you can have multiple SD cards and just pop them in and out if you want to change it. So you have one for this is my media system, you pop it out. This is my Informix system, pop it out. This is, you know, my Informix test system. And you don't have to reinstall or plug in different hard drives or anything else. You can just pop in and out the card to change the operating system. The next one is the BeagleBone. This one's a little bit more powerful. Um, same sort of thing where it has the GPIO uh, connectors. Uh, it'll actually run entirely off of uh, power over Ethernet. It's got the uh, five volt adapter, um, or you can power it off of uh, USB. Um, quite a few of the demos you'll see, uh, especially if you go to check out any of um, the Informix booths where they're running ARM products uh, at any of the conferences, they're usually running with the Beagle Bones. Um, they're just decent little systems. Uh, again, they're about the size of a credit card. Um, Runs about 50 bucks, I think it's 55 currently. It's a one gigahertz uh, dual core V7, uh, half gig of RAM, and it's got four gigs of onboard storage. So it's actually got a little tiny SSD hard drive built in that you can run the, um, the operating system off of. Um, one of my favorite features of this is it actually has a built-in private networking on the USB. So if you actually power it off the USB to another computer, you actually create a little private network between that system and the other and the computer you hook it into and are powering off of. So not only you gain the power, you can also network to it and then use it as a little uh, microsystem without needing to have any other networking stuff engaged. Um, QB truck. This is my favorite one for doing higher power. You notice quite a few more adapters on it. Um, this one is a full dual core. It's got, uh, in the bottom, you notice here, it's actually got a full SATA port on it. Um, and the power adapters there, so it'll actually power a full SATA hard drive. It's also got VGA, it's got higher def audio, it's got HDMI. Um, the other nice thing is it has eight gigs of built-in uh, hard drive. It's got the micro SD slot, and you can hook a SATA power adapter to it. So you can actually run three hard drives off of this one little system. It's a little bit bigger than the others, but not a hugely. Um, it's about, you know, maybe twice the size of the other two. Um, runs about 100 bucks. runs at a gigahertz. It's got two gigs of DDR3 memory. So it is quite, you know, the other ones are about a half gig. So it is quite a bit better there. It has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, uh, built in. And my favorite thing about this, and this is the case for all of them, they're all incredibly low power. You think about your normal desktop at home, you've probably got a 500 watt power supply on it. You know, most time running idle, you run about 150 to 200 watts. Your server sitting in the office, you know, maybe they have dual 800 watt power supplies sitting at, you know, using 600 to 800 during normal business hours. This will run about 2.3 watts idle and about 4.9 running at full load. Um, so when I've maxed out 100% both CPUs, it'll set about 4.9 watts. So you can think about just how much lower the power usage is for this kind of hardware. Um, so why you actually should care about this? Why does this matter? Is a lot of people are saying this is the future of computing, at least in some regards. We are used to, at least those of us that have been around for a long while, are used to the concept of having a big you know, whether it's a Sun E10K or whether it's one of the new Lenovo boxes or something else, most of your processing, processing when it comes to a database is one big, huge system. Um, you know, if you need more power on it, you add more drives, you add more RAM, you add another CPU, you unlock something else, and you move about your business. And once you've maxed it out, you go and talk to your uh, finance team about getting a, a new data warehouse system. These are a different model. They're small, they're very low power, they're low cost, and they're low heat. The low heat does matter because if you're embedding this in a device, you're not going to want to put a fan in. You're not going to want to have to deal with a whole lot of extra exhaust vents, you know, if the system starts running heavier. You want it to be able to regulate its own temperature with just a little bit of air room. And that's what the ARM chip lets you do. Um, you know, the other thing is the low power is what quite a few people, I, I know Google's put out some white papers on, on at least generally what they're doing in terms of their power usage and the cooling. But for a lot of their data centers, and that's case across for pretty much any industry, the data centers and your, your processing centers, your biggest expense is not the hardware, it is the power and cooling. The ARM systems allow you to run far more systems 
far cheaper because you're dealing with far less power bills and then you have to deal with far less cooling, which also contributes to needing less power and, you know, less environmental impact. So it is, you know, friendly to Johnny Polar Bear. It, you know, gives you some more flexibility and it's cheaper. Um, one of the fun things when you're dealing with these systems, I like to use the, the BeagleBone Black for this because it's small, it's portable, and it's got that local uh, USB network is you can take an informing instance in your pocket. You don't need to worry about needing to get another system to have it up and running and deal with it on your laptop when it's you know clogging everything else down. You can have a little tiny dedicated informix instance there up and running for development, for testing. If you want to you know offload something, it's there. It can scale your environment horizontally. Um, again, we think about things, you know, we have one big system, we just add more hardware to it if we need, you know, which is not cheap in most cases and usually requires downtime. But we just scale it as big as possible straight up. What this lets you do is with the, the ARM architecture, the intention is you go horizontally. You need more processing power, great. Go buy a few more, you know, inexpensive ARM systems plug them into the network, add them to the cluster, you know, put them in however, and you're adding more processing power with no downtime and very little overhead or infrastructure costs. Um, the ARM systems are great for managing sensors. You know, again, Mike talked extensively about the Internet of Things. I'll, I'll touch on it a bit more. But it's really nice to have a little tiny system that can handle your sensor data your, or even do a home automation or you know, you're taking in data from all these sensors you may have on your body, around your house, wherever your situation may be, and it can take all that data, crunch it, and then do something with it. It can, t it, you know, microcontrollers are good at getting a little bit of data and making, you know, a small decision. This can take all the all your data. You know, this can check what is the humidity in your house. What is the you know temperature in this room versus this room over the last day? Do we need to change the fan things? You can set up all kinds of advanced computing on these systems to take your sensor data and actually do something with it. Um, again, you can use this as a dedicated remote device. And as time passes, they're just getting faster, they're getting smaller, they're getting just better supported out there. You know, when they initially first came out, it was hard to find even a Linux distribution that would play nicely with them. Now you have your, you know, pick of varieties, you know, you have a whole slew for just about any hardware you want. And as it's becoming more and more of a common architecture, it's getting far easier to find software that runs on it. So just as an example, again, on the power usage, I, I did took this actually um, earlier today, is that's my QB truck, so giving you a size. And I've got a kilowatt here. This will actually tell you running through an AC, adapt, um, an AC outlet how much is actually getting pulled. So on the left, that's it running idle. On the right, that's running a full benchmark. Um, this is the benchmark. I've checked this on our desktops and our test systems at the office. They easily pull over 300 watts doing this. You know, it's pulling 4.7. Again, you know, if you think about what your uh, the power cost is at your house on the winter versus the summer, or even or if you've looked at your power usage at the office, you know, what could you do to drastically dropping your power usage? What would that do to your you know infrastructure costs? Um, you know, there's a lot of things to, that go into the ARM architecture that really make it appealing for a corporate environment. Obviously, it's not going to replace everything, but there are certain instances where people are running larger servers that we really could offload some of these processing to some smaller systems and have some fairly significant savings in the process. So sensors. Um, you know, again, most of the ARM boards out there, especially things like the Raspberry Pi and BeagleBone, they're specifically meant to work with breadboards, to hook into sensors, to for you to be able to connect sensors in either directly or have them in wirelessly and stream them data. There's a huge amount of community support for how you actually get them hooked up. If you just Google any type of sensor in either Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone, you will find plenty of step-by-step -step guides for how do you hook this in, how do you work the wiring, how do we deal with the code. It's very easy to do. Um, it's really easy to get them up and running to take data and then actually do something with it. Um, the big cons, the big, uh, feature that a lot of places are do, touting is the gateway concept with the Internet of Things. This is a singular device that will take all your different sensors, regardless on you know, which manufacturer they're from, what kind of data they're sending, and will take it and put it all into a single location and allow you to actually make intelligent decisions with it. 
So again, the ARM processor, and you certainly can do this with Intel. You can certainly do this with, you know, the old standard, you know, with the desktop system. But then you're running a desktop system. You have to have all the infrastructure that goes ahead on with it, rather than just one little tiny, you know, credit card side piece that, you know, most offices I've seen them, you know, they can just mount it to a wall somewhere, and it just looks like, you know, the same as any of their networking devices or their telecom or anything else. It's just a little tiny device. They don't have to think about that much, and that's one of the key things we're going to get to with Informix. However, in the meantime, one of the cool things being done with an ARM is clustering. Um, this is, again, the horizontal scaling where you take, rather than having one big system, you have a lot of small ones. And this example that uh, they put together, the team did, uh, that puts out QB Truck, 20 of them running together in a single cluster with a pair of solid state disks. And they're doing actually on this one, I believe, as a Hadoop cluster. But what they actually were doing with this was showing that, you know, you could spread the load, 20 of these systems across in a single computer space. Uh, you know, so you're dealing with 40 cores, 40 gigs of RAM, you know, uh, 40 hard drive, actually 42 hard drives because you have the um, onboard run with each one, each system. You know, you could really spread out load like this and, you know, much easier manage it that, than you would with the traditional system. And on top of that, again, 40 of these running maxed out, you're still only talking um, 200 watts of power. That's still less than your traditional server, and this is probably will outpace it. Um, so again, you can get all the marketing buzzwords out with this sort of thing. You're using Hadoop and NoSQL and ARM and Cluster and all those, and you can impress your NoSQL friends. But we're going to talk about how we're going to actually do this with Informix. One thing on the cluster, though, that HP is putting out, I just want to mention this quickly, is they they put out a commercial server doing this. Uh, it's an ARM-based system. You can have up to 720 cores and 11 and a half terabytes of storage in a 4U chassis. Um, they have these little cards you plug into it, and you just basically pick and choose the type of card and add it in. Um, so you can really customize it for your particular environment, still a much lower power and space than you would with a traditional system. Um, just do a picture of it. I've got links at the end if you're interested in it. Um, Informix will run on this. Um, I don't know that we have benchmarks yet. I would love to see it if we could get them. So what's IBM doing with it? So one of the big things, and a lot of the, it is the Informix team, but uh, they put out an IoT starter kit for rapid development. It's a little bit underpowered. I looked over the specs of it. Um, your ras the newer Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone will outpace it. But it's a starter kit with a small arm board and some sensors that will actually let you take set it up and actually feed the sensor data directly through and then into their Bluemix system. Um, Bluemix, I'm, you may have heard about in the past presentations, but it is their cloud offering where you can take uh, and store data and do analytics on it and everything else. They include everything already set up. Um, they've also been releasing Docker images for Informix on ARM as well as Informix on some other instances. They put out, and this is my favorite thing, the Informix ARM Developer Edition, free of charge. So you can go online, and honestly, Google's the easiest way to get to it, but just Google uh, Informix ARM download, or if you go to the IBM website, you can find it through there. They'll make you do a quick sign up for it, but then it's uh, free to use. This is for development only. Um, so you can use it in-house for your development, your testing, but you cannot use it for production, um, just as fair note. Then the last thing that they're doing that I want to promote is they've been starting to put together IoT hackathons, and this is based around Informix and it's based around using ARM, um, but it's the concept is actually, again, taking the sensor data, doing something with it, doing the whole Internet of Things concept, um, but they're putting together basically curriculum for it. I know that uh, there's talk of some of the South American user groups putting it together. I know there's discussion on some other places that are actually you know, like looking to put together a proper hackathon. Around the IoT, around IoT on Informix on ARM, tying it into Bluemix, tying it into all the other IBM technology they've been working on. And so, stay tuned uh, for it. Or if you are a group leader or interested in it, um, you know, feel free to contact uh, myself, and I'll see if I can get you in contact. Um, Darren Tracy is another good reference uh, if you're interested in finding out more. I know he's been working to put it together. So Bluemix, this is IBM's cloud solution. What they have is they have all these different services you can sign up for. One of the key ones is Time Series, which is really Informix under the covers. It gives you access to a full Informix instance. 
And what it does is by having it, it have all these APIs set up for REST, MongoDB, JDBC, multiple APIs to connect to this um, cloud system. So you can take your little system, your application, whatever, and stream data directly to your private um, section of the Bluemix cloud, and then use uh, the tools on there or write applications against it to then uh, actually run data, run applications in the cloud against this data source, and it's all hosted for you. It's already set up for you. You don't have to think about it. And, you know, once your product has hit big, you know, it's now scaled to a million users. You know, everyone loves it. You're becoming the next Facebook. You can then just uh, buy more resources from Bluemix and just, you know, um, get more power, more disk, more RAM, whatever it is, you can individually customize exactly what you need from them and they will dynamically allocate it for you. Um, it's very easy to get up and running. There's all kinds of guides for it. So highly recommend you check it out if you're interested in the whole IoT concept, even if you're, it's not your final destination, it'll at least let you get up and running quickly. So step back a little bit from ARM here. But we're going to talk about what makes Informix suited for ARM. Why am I actually so enthusiastic about getting Informix up on ARM? Because Informix is not the only database on ARM. It is one of the few commercial ones. Um, but why should you use it over one of the other options? I've heard a number of people tell me, you know, why should I look at this over using NoSQL? What makes us different? What are not NoSQL, SQL Lite. What makes us different? What makes this worth me spending some extra time and if this grows, need to pay a license. Well, the big thing is if you're looking at a commercial solution, if you're looking at creating a product, if you're looking at doing something that is going to be out in public, you're going to want commercial support. You want to have a company you can call and request features, deal with bug reports, deal with support. Something goes wrong, you have somebody watching your back. In this case, you'd be having IBM and all of IBM's technical support and support systems at your back, and the Informix team is fantastic on uh, dealing with problems and getting uh, fixes and releases out. Um, the next thing is Informix has been around for a very long time and is very underrated for what it does. There's a reason that Many of the commercial banks in the world, many of the places, of the companies that need very reliable, high volume transactions come to Informix. Uh, number, I know a number of Fortune 500 companies actually view Informix as a competitive advantage um, because it is so stable and so reliable and needs so little database administration. Um, the other nice thing is because several telecom or telecom and networking companies use Informix in their products, there's been a lot of work done to make it embeddable and very easy to be hands-off um, administration on it. So you don't have to worry about the, you know, the system crashing or the system filling up or what have you. They've put in all kinds of new features, especially in later versions of 11 and version 12, to make it more hands-off database administration. So even if you're listening to this uh, or watching this talk and you never think you're going to use ARM, you may still have some, but you're running in Formix, there may still be features here that are of interest to you. So a couple of the key ones I'm going to talk about are the low memory manager, flexible grid, grid queries, sharded queries, auto tuning, auto log rotation, storage pool, and actually talk about custom deployment installs. Almost all of these are introduced either in late 11.7 or in version 12. So if you're still running on 10, uh, you'll need to check the guide, but most of these prob you'll probably need to look at upgrading, which you really should anyway for nothing else than the uh, performance improvements in the later versions. So um, a couple of things specifically about Informix that make it appealing for these sort of products is again, with ARM systems, most of the time, you're not going to be running it as a database administrator. You may if you're enhancing your current network. Most of the people out there that are looking at ARM, they're looking at actually creating a product with it. They're looking at creating a solution with it, whether it's a gateway, whether it is something that's a sensor-based, whether it is something out there controlling a robot or a 3D printer or whatever it is. It's being, looking at being sold as a black box. So what we need is something that will run small, fast, and reliable. And Informix has a number of features that are really good for all of those. One of the big things is you can tune Informix, and out of the box it's pretty good at this anyway, to have a very low memory footprint. 
You can also say and set it to have a very low install footprint. So if you are on a very limited system, you can actually get Informix's install to be as low as 50 megs um, of space. There is, I actually link to a presentation at the end where they actually uh, detail how they got it that small, which was fantastic. Um, it's very reliable. You can have a DBA, as I call it, DBA free. I wouldn't recommend that for your data warehouse, but for small systems that are in a very closed environment that you know what's coming in, you know what's going on and how it's going to be used, you can actually run a full database without a database administrator. Um, you can really tune them for any workload. They'll go from the smallest systems, you know, on tiny little boxes, dealing with little trickles of data, to huge, you know, multi-terabyte data warehouses for um, corporations. And the nice thing is if you're looking at this as a potential database choice for a solution, you can scale it. And it all plays together. That same database you're running on your box that's maybe running with, you know, 300 megs of data that's coming through in a stream, you can actually feed that same data into the enterprise edition on back in the office, you know, to capture multiple terabytes of data and be able to slice and dice it and get results out very quickly with the same uh, database engine. You're not having to do any translation there. And the other thing is, because a lot of people are interested in the NoSQL side, it has full MongoDB support for the APIs. So if you have an application running Mongo, you can directly port it over into Informix. Um, they also have full JSON and BSUN support, so if you're just a general NoSQL developer, it'll play very nicely with what you have as well. Um, it has a built-in scheduler, because in a lot of cases, you do not want to have to deal with cron when you're dealing with a black box environment. So you can actually schedule tasks through the Informix schedule, and it'll handle it for you like a little cron that you can control through SQL. Um, it also has a full cloning tool, so if you're used to using deployment systems or any of the you know Linux automatic installs, you can actually set up Informix to do the same thing to, either, to install it in a number of different ways that are automatically set up for you. So jumping through them, the first one is a low memory manager. Um, this is a really nice utility if you're on a system that is constantly low on room or you're on a system that you don't are not going to be able to be hands-on in case of problems. So what it will do is you actually tune it, you enable it, and um, you tell the scheduler to run it. And you, I actually give on the second uh, bullet point there the, the syntax for it. But what you actually do is you give it a start and stop threshold and an idle time. And what it will do is... Whenever the scheduler runs, it'll check the amount of memory free on the instance. And if it's hitting the limit or it's close to the limit and it's under the start threshold, what it will actually do is start a three-step process. The first one, it goes through idle sessions, which is the last parameter, how many seconds are considered, considered idle, and start killing them. Um, then it goes to the highest memory sessions, so the ones that are hogging the most. So if you've got a runaway application, it'll go through and kill it for you automatically. Um, and lastly, it runs an on-mode-f to free any memory segments that are no longer in use. Um, do note that once it actually hits that stop threshold, you know, it's not going to keep killing sessions. It's not going to go wipe everything out. It's just going to kill it till you hit that second threshold, which is the high water mark. At that point, it'll chug things along, and if you dip back down, it'll go start the process again, but it will make sure that your system is not going to run out of room on you, so you have enough uh, memory to keep moving along, and you're not going to have a crash on that. The second thing, and this is, you know, uh, been around for a very long time, but it just keeps getting better and better, is enterprise replication. Um, it is an asynchronous replication for Informix. You can set it up to update uh, targeted, update anywhere, so you can have multiple systems in replication. You can have multiple systems where some of the data is in point A or point B, some where it's fed from you know, feeder systems into a central system. Lots of ways to configure it, lots of ways to tune it. Um, it's all configurable for collision management, so if you have three systems that all feed, two of them happen to submit the same data at the same time, it's going to actually know how to handle that collision. You set up the rules to tell it which one takes precedence, how do I handle it if I'm getting two systems that are identical feeding at the same time. You can either configure it by database level, by table, by column level. You can even do it by individual row level. It is fast, it is reliable, it does not need to be real time. So if you have systems that are not on the best networks, it'll take care of that for you. Uh, but the nice thing is in terms of the larger presentation we're talking about here, 
is it allows for horizontal scaling. You can have all your little arm feeder systems feeding to your central box. You can have you know, the data spread out across a cluster. It will let you configure out your um, environment however you need to. And the, be and the best part speed-wise, it allows you for distributed queries. And so you can tell it to use the fastest, you know, you can use the connection manager, tell it to use the fastest part of the node. You can actually set it up to read from 10 different systems at the same time if you've spread out the data correctly. It'll do all kinds of things under the covers to speed it up as fast as possible. So there's lots of ways to make use of the architecture of more smaller systems rather than just need to have one big one that handles everything. So on top of the enterprise replication is the flexible grid system, which was introduced in 11. And what it lets you do is put a grid on top of an ER solution and actually set up a set of systems that you can all manage through a single uh, environment. So you can have mixed environments of hardware and operating systems, which also allows you to do rolling upgrades and you know take one system down without having any experiencing any downtime. Um, you can replicate it across many nodes. And you can use the connection manager attached to the flexible grid to define rules for which applications use which part of the, no, the cluster to figure out which one is the least used system to use that to really do things to spread your load out. It allows you to have no downtime upgrades because of allowing you having mixed modes of version of hardware operating systems as well as Informix versions, you can actually do rolling upgrades. Um, then you can actually also, because the flexible grid will allow you to push out changes to your schema through a single SQL statement to the whole grid, rather than need to go and modify uh, each table individually, and then start and restart, um, reinitialize the replication process. So it'll simplify your management of the system. So if you're dealing with a large number of systems, it'll let you handle it far easier than trying to do it all by hand. So with the flexible grid comes grid, grid queries, which were introduced in version 12. Um, and what it'll actually let you do is allow you to actually select, if you put in the select statement with grid, it'll actually go out and query across all the grid components in one, uh, in a single query to actually return back the data. The other thing it'll do is the equivalent of fragmentation elimination, where it actually use segment elimination and will only pull from places it needs to to return the data. So it reduces the number of reads you have, reduces the amount of network traffic, and uh, will get you back the data even faster. So again, when you're spread out across you know, 20, you know, in that uh, cluster example, you got 20 QB trucks there, you can actually then query, run a single query, single statement that'll go out, read from all 20 of them in parallel. So rather than dealing with two disks or four disks, you're now dealing with you know, 20, 30 disks running all at the same time, 20, you know, 40 CPUs all trying to process at the same time to get you back the data as fast as possible. Uh, there's also introduced sharded queries. Uh, this is for the JSON folks. Um, so JSON, again, is a NoSQL data type. So it's basically a free, not entirely free form, but it is a, a large text field with uh, key value pairs in them. Um, and what I'll actually let you do is if you have a JSON data and you actually set it up uh, across a larger cluster, you can shard queries. And actually, if you do a query on the NoSQL data type, it'll let you actually do elimination based on fields. So if the field doesn't exist in this uh, set of, you know, you, you have 10 different uh, systems. Each one has a different year's worth of data on it. If you introduce the field in year four, you run a sharded query. It's only going to look at uh, systems four through four through ten. All of the others it's just going to eliminate and not even bother querying. So it'll speed up your queries. You know, there's all these little things under the covers just to make uh, queries come back as fast as possible. Um, the shard queries are all based around the MongoDB API integration, so it's all using the Mongo commands. So the Informix engine itself, the auto-tuning, these are a lot of new features they put in to make administration easier. Um, the master one is auto-tune. If you set this in the onconfig, anything, any of the following ones on this page that are not defined will be marked as enabled. Um, there's auto AIO VPS, uh, which is actually tuning the number of AIO VPs you have. 
So if it starts seeing that it's the number of current ones are not able to keep up, it'll automatically allocate new ones. Um, the auto checkpoints will actually speed, it will decrease um, the checkpoint interval if it thinks that you're not keeping up because what it wants to do in that case is make the, them flush out more frequently so you have less to write out at each checkpoint so you hopefully are blocking less or none at all. Um, the LRU tuning will automatically tune the LRUs to what it thinks is going to be the best on your environment. Your read ahead will be if it starts seeing that your query is waiting on I.O., it'll start uh, actively using read ahead more frequently to maximize your throughput of data coming back. Um, the re-prepare, the auto re-prepare, will actually, if you have it enabled, if you do a schema change to a table that has store procedures or a already prepared query, it'll try to re-prepare it for that particular, um, for the new schema. Uh, there are some limitations. If you're looking at using this, I'd definitely read up on the manual on it, but it's really the case for all of these. Um, the auto stat mode will actually try to, uh, if you have that set, will actually try to limit the amount of distributions it updates, especially during the um, auto update statistics. Rather than trying to update all of the distributions, it'll only uh, try to update the ones that are missing or stale. So there's a few other auto features that they've added in. Um, auto L log uh, will actually add logical logs if it thinks that more logs will actually help your performance. Um, you actually define a DB space with it and it will just you know, tack on more as it thinks it will help your system. Dynamic logs, which you want to use in uh, tandem with it, and this is probably the more useful one, will ag automatically add logical logs if it thinks that a transaction is going to block the system. So if you're running something that's hitting your close to your high watermark on a long transaction, this will automatically go out, add some more logs to prevent a system block or a rollback. Um, so the auto-locate will actually add um, new uh, databases into a specified DB space rather than into root DBS and will also automatically add rad, round robin fragmentation by default rather than having it go everything into a single DB space. Again, your environment, whether or not any of these are particularly useful, it really depends. The dynamic logs are the big one that will, you know, help prevent blocking if something is uh, hogging all the logs or for some reason your system can't keep up writing logs out to disk. Um, so auto stats or auto update statistics uh, has been introduced. It uses the system scheduler and will go through and check all the tables or however you have it defined to see how much they've changed and actually add the, the what it assumes is best update statistics it can come up with into the OS command table. Um, and then it'll run them during the period that you define. By default, it's Saturday and Sunday mornings between 1 and 5 a.m. All this is tunable. The one big thing I would say with this is we, we have seen from experience, do not run both auto update statistics and a manual update statistics at the, um, together. Uh, they tend to just be duplicating work at that point, or you can even get worse statistics by by just you know going over the same things over and over and having potentially outdated distributions. If you know one part does a high, then you drop distributions and do a low, then you're missing distributions you need to make sure it's consistent. So either go one way or the other. But on a black box system, update stat, auto update stats is probably a good thing because you, know, you could have, uh, if you're using an internet gateway, for example, you could have it grow in one particular table you're not expecting and suddenly you really need a different level and it'll automatically tune to what the, it thinks is the best type. So it overall works pretty well. Doing a more targeted one or even using uh, Art Kegel's do stats generally give you slightly better results, but this certainly has gotten far, um, auto update stats is certainly a viable option. So another one that I don't see used enough, uh, but is a very nice feature is the auto log rotation. And this will actually let you rotate your online log, your on-bar log, whatever logs you want to using the scheduler or doing it manually in this example. But where you do is you actually tell it how many logs you want to keep, it'll automatically rotate them through so you can say how long you want to keep them or until they get to what size. And then you can actually configure it all to automatically handle it for you. I've seen a number of people that will go on, look at their online log. It's got 
seven years worth of data. The online log is sitting at six gigs of space. And if you're on a small limited device, you know, if your online log has hit six gigs, you may be filling up the var, you know, the op directory or what op partition or wherever it may be stored at. And so you really probably want to have this if you're on a, if putting together a black box system. Um, another feature that was introduced is the storage pool. Um, this is along with a number of updates to the storage system, but what it lets you do is actually define a space on disk, a raw disk, or even a directory, and you tell it to the storage pool to use the space, and then it's very easy either to manually allocate more space for a DB space. You just tell it, grab more from the storage pool as a single function task to do so, or you can actually set DB spaces now to automatically grow, and they can grow into the storage pool. So uh, you can have your DB spaces, if you size them for 20 gigs, so, you know, you can set up the system so that it'll fill up as much as you have available and give you far more flexibility and again, far less hands-on for um, system administration purposes. Again, if you're dealing with a black box system, being able to grow in rather than having to assume um, storage size may be a good thing. Um, all depends on your environment. Um, there, I put a real simple example here about how to how to run it. If you're looking at putting this in an enterprise environment, I would really read up on the, the documents on it or some of the papers on how to set it up because there's a lot of different options, a lot of different ways to configure the storage pool. So you want to make sure you set it up the best for your environment. So custom deployments. So during the install of Informix, I'm sure many of you at least have gone through the customization option, and you can actually select or unselect options. Um, so you can really tune down, you know, if you aren't planning on doing international support, you know, it's only going to be in English or German or French or whatever it may be, you don't necessarily need to have the documentation language in every language or all of the GLS files for all the other languages. Um, you can really tune down how much stuff you have. You may not need the JDBC driver. You may not need some of the other features, and that'll let you save space. You can also use IFX clone to actually clone an instance to another site um, to allow you to help actually set up the same way as you did on one site. You can use the deployment wizard, which is a very nice system that'll actually let you go through your entire instance once it is configured and actually choose exactly what pieces you want to keep including the space, including the data, and it will actually create a zip file or a compressed file that you can then go put on a remote system and just using a single command, and you can set this up through a batch file, is use the deployment, um, the IFX deploy to utility to then deploy it back out to the system. And it'll, um, it'll basically install it exactly like it was on your initial system or however you configured it to, to take onto your new system so you could one step install to, so if you're rolling out new systems, you're adding it to the cluster, you can do a one step install or a two step install to actually now deploy your Informix instance and then you have a little script that connects it into the cluster. Um, you can also set up a response file during the install process or manually and actually use that with the installer to do a silent install. So if you don't have a created clone version or deployed version, you, you can actually set up a silent version to actually go through, do the proper install for you, and have it up and running. Um, the other thing I will mention is, for those of you that may not be Informix familiar, Informix on Unix runs everything out of a single directory, um, and you can configure it otherwise, but by default it's all out of one directory for the binaries and configuration files you can tar up that directory and move it to another system on the same architecture, assuming you, the libraries match, et cetera, um, and it will allow you to run. Again, make sure you're within license compliance before you do this, uh, but so you can always just tarball the directory and move it over. So Informix on ARM, why, again, a couple of ideas here, because some of these are higher level concepts of why you'd actually want to pair Informix and ARM past what we talked about. Um, one of which is mobile out. This is one that I personally do. I have a beagle bone that I actually plug into um, systems using the USB port. And I now have a copy of out right there running that I can tie into the network with as, as long as I connect it up to the network. Or even, and you theoret theoretically could even just hook the um, beagle bone into the server itself. And you now have out up and running. Um, out is the open admin tool. Uh, it's a graphical user. I will show a demo of that in a few minutes. 
Um, On-demand processing, what I mean here is you can actually have in your environment cases where you have heavy usage periods, whether it is your financial institution, you're hitting end of physical year, or you know it is the holiday rush and you're a retailer, you need, may need some extra processing or there may be some offloaded processing that you could use. You could take a couple of one or a couple of these ARM systems, load sets of data through replication on them and actually do your sub-processing on the separate system, taking that load off of your production box. Um, Again, the gateways for IoT, Shaspo is a really good example of this. It'll take, you know, all of your data from, you have two, I think they have 150, 200 kinds of different sensors and different manufacturers. It'll read the data from and then give you nice graphs and a nice web page and nice management tools to go and view all that data in a single point, keep it historical, and let you do all kinds of stuff off of a single device. Um, feeders for enterprise systems, one of the things I'd like to see more of is Smaller applications, smaller systems, whether it's reading sensors, whether it is, you know, doing something with some other application or even hardware, you know, maybe it's something where it's in a robotics lab where, you know, it tracks the uh, measurements on whatever the latest robotic piece is and then feeds that data back using the connection, uh, the standard connection tools, JDBC, ODBC, some of the APIs, back to an, your enterprise system, your big data warehouse box you could use these small ARM systems to actually feed the data in. Um, you don't need to write a whole bunch of custom code because you could have the sensors tied to ARM and the ARM using the native Informix to, um, libraries to send the data over. It's a really good match for networking devices. If you want to get into teleco, you want to create your own router, your own switch, your own device to, that runs as a SIP, uh, you know, telephony device. You know, the ARM systems are lo small, low power, Informix is great at doing long-term storage. All kinds of really nice features that pair together that you could create some very cool devices with it and then look at actually creating a product. And finally, developing solutions is, you know, it's actually creating the final product that you're trying to get to. So again, the mobile OAT works really well. Offloading processing, uh, you know, I'm, is really, really nice to, uh, you know, have your outside systems to, you know, take your load off of, you know, your account manager who's going to be running through every single person that you, every single customer need to run financials against. You can take that massive load off, put it into a separate system and, you know, be done with it and not have to worry about it slamming your production box for a couple of days. Um, your IoT gateway, again, is multiple protocols going into a single site. Theaters, you have all kinds of options here for having a full-featured database that then can feed, that can stream data through the grid or through the cluster, or just stream it through the standard um, connection protocols into your primary production system. Because again, most of the time, you know, the little systems are doing the clusters are good, but there will be times that you want all your data in a single source to do some kind of huge analytics against, and that's where having one big system and Informix on Enterprise works great for this uh, to crunch all your numbers. So networking device, again, uh, it also runs on Linux, which is really used commonly in many devices. And honestly, there's a lot of networking companies that you probably don't realize are already running Informix under the covers. So developing it. So you actually want to get up and running and create something with Informix. For one, the developer edition is available on ARM right now. So you can go get it for free. You can also obviously get the uh, developer edition for, you know, PCs for, um, for you know, all the old, uh, the older system. I shouldn't say older, but the, uh, the traditional Unix systems of HP, UX, AIX. Um, they do have a Mac port of Informix available. Um, they also have what's called the Innovator C edition for, uh, specifically it's for Intel, but it will actually give you a free version that's fairly limited, but it's a good way to get started. But it, the all of the Informix instances, and there's also the client SDK, they come with um, you know, the developer tools if you want to do C code, if you want to do uh, Java code, and you can go out online and get drivers for just about every language out there if you want to actually develop software with it. So 
it's very easy to get started. There's tons of example code out there. Um, if you decide you want to develop a product, so you, you, know, you develop code, that's one thing, but if you want to develop a product, a lot of people don't think about the possibility of this, but it really is a paradigm shift. You know, 15 years ago, if you wanted to bring a product to market, an actual device, an actual physical thing with electronics, you were getting millions of dollars. You're going to Bell Labs. You're going to IBM Labs. You're going to one of the major companies, getting huge amounts of money, spending years in prototyping and everything else, then going to the manufacturing process. You need, you need to have it be able to show you can at least sell, you know, so many millions of them or 500,000 of them or however many. Um, to get up and running. So it's mostly large companies that were doing it. However, things have changed. With the advent of these low cost, low power systems in ARM, both with the existing ones or the ability to make them modular, it is very, it's much, much easier to get into the development game, to actually create a product. If you have an idea, you can go out, prototype it on these existing systems, write the code, write, have it do what you want it to do, with a couple hundred bucks worth of off-the-shelf pieces. And then once you like it, you put together the schemas, the, to all the different parts you need to. You can then contract with companies, most of them are in, are in Asia, um, to actually go develop these, send you a prototype version, and if you're happy with it, you know, they can crank out a few thousand or even a few hundred in many cases. You know, they are agile enough to be able to do very limited small runs of these and then scale it up as you need it to. It's much cheaper, much easier to get up and running, and you don't need a huge monolithic corporation supporting you to do it. Um, you know, you can take an idea and run with it. Um, there is the Raspberry Pi folks, they kept a running blog as they were getting their product out the door, and they actually detail really well what the processors would like to actually get a man, the manufacturing pipeline going and actually then partner with retailers. So if it's something you're interested in, I highly recommend it. The other thing you want to do if you're looking at doing this is you talk to IBM or a um, reseller or partner to actually talk about OEM agreements. The, the one uh, piece with the ARM port right now is you cannot buy a single copy. You have the developer edition for in-house, or you can get an OEM license. And the OEM licenses, you need to talk to IBM about pricing with them, but it's a per, you know, you can set up many ways to do it, and you, you work with them to figure out what works for your company and your product. And the goal is to make something that everybody wins at, and you have a, you know, fully featured Informix installation now available that you just bundle in with your product. And each one is, is licensed with IBM and you don't have to worry about individually tracking, you just have to track, you know, or it's whatever your agreement I really should say is. But in many cases it is by sales or by number you have. But again, talk to your IBM, I'm not a OEM, uh, I've not done an OEM agreement with IBM for a particular product, so I can't say I speak from experience here, but just from understanding how the OEM product process works. Um, Again, modern days, the time to market is much quicker, and you really can make a product. If you have that idea for why doesn't my router, you know, water my plants? Why doesn't, why don't I have something that opens my shades in the morning? You really can build it, whether you're building it for yourself or whether you're building something that you want to then go and sell. You really can. It's, and this is not, you know, infomercial, you know, sham wow type of things. This is you really can go out and create a physical product that gets to the market and have something that you really can have a success with. Um, you know, there's a lot of very much startup companies or, you know, in the basement type uh, hardware creators these days because you really can do it. I mean, now with the advent of 3D printers, you may not even need uh, those outside sources to actually manufacture it. You might be able to do limited runs yourself without even needing anyone else. So a couple of links here. Um, obviously, all of the Informix commands, um, Google it. There is Check the, the documents based on your version for the latest um, syntax with them. So I didn't include those here because it would take way too long. But a couple of uh, links that might be worthwhile, which I'm also I'm talking so they stay up a bit longer. And Google will find these if you search for them if you don't have the, this presentation handy. 
at the 2015 IEG conference, Jeff Trees put out a great um, presentation on actually running Informix on different platforms. This covers ARM, this covers the Intel Quark, this covers a number of other types, and kind of what IBM is doing with it. It's a really good one if you're curious about the direction of it or some of the other ways people are using it. Um, the second one there is actually the link to the hackathon information. Um, third link the, is a fantastic presentation. It's a few years old, but it's still totally relevant. Um, again, from the IEG from the 2011 conference, where it's actually going into ha embeddability features and actually tuning down the Informix to make it as small as possible. It's really fascinating to see how small they were able to get it. Um, then the last ones are just a couple of the different products I mentioned, the Beagle Bone, the Raspberry Pi, the HP Moonshot. You know, there's a lot of different things out there. So I'm going to get to questions in a minute, but I want to show a demo first. Uh, our next webcast, and this one is going to be one I'm going to be discussing. It's not ARM specific, but it is certainly relevant if you're interested in Informix on ARM. I'm going to be going through the basics of getting up and running with Informix. If you've never used Informix before or you've never administered it before, it's going to be a really good discussion and demonstration of, okay, I've got the Informix installer. How do I go from that to having something I can actually work with? Um, we're not going to get into real deep tuning on it. We're going to get into getting up and running, you know, for, uh, your first steps, getting Informix going. Um, this will work, be relevant for any operating system you may be running. Um, I just realized I did not update the year and date. It should be say Informix training in 2015. Uh, this is uh, Advanced Data Tools, our company. We run Informix training. Uh, we do this both out of our office in Andale, Virginia, as well as we offer them online. They're, it's a joint class. You can go either way. Uh, we promise we'll never cancel a course as long as we have a student registered. Um, our next one's upcoming July 20th to the 23rd. We have the Advanced Informix Performance Tuning. And then the October 12th through the 15th, that is the Informix for Database Administrators. They're both fantastic classes. So even if you know, you're listening, you know all this stuff, you may have somebody in the office that it's relevant to, it is certainly worth looking at. Feel free to contact us for uh, any questions with it. Um, so I'm going to hop out of the presentation. I will come back to questions in a moment. But I wanted to go through the general concept of what is ARM. You know, it is a small, again, low-power system, but it really opens up a lot of different possibilities. Um, it's why I'm so excited about the future of it, the fact that IBM has put so many resources behind making sure Informix runs on it and runs stably on it, um, and the fact that it's so cheap to kind of get into the game on it. You know, a lot of people I have talked to now will have a Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone sitting around that they picked up that they're playing with, and adding in the ability to have a full-fledged database on there is amazing for the possibilities because as everyone likes to say, it's the age of big data. We're going to have so many petabytes you know, per person coming out by 2018, whatever the latest specs may be on it. Um, but actually having a way to store it, not just sorting through flat files, not just sorting through SQLite files, not having to deal with uh, other databases that routinely corrupt indexes or don't give you support or don't give you real flexibility. You know, the fact that Informix gives you full NoSQL support, full clustering, full any direction replication, all the different features for just about any kind of application you might be looking at really is a very compelling reason why to look at Informix, even if you have not used it before, as your database of choice um, when coming into the ARM environment. And honestly, if they also have, are looking at Quark uh, support if you happen to be on the Intel side. And obviously, the, uh, the tr more traditional x86, um, you know, and 64-bit and all the other environments that they support. So I'm going to flip uh, out here. The first thing I do is show you uh, Oat on ARM. Uh, this is right now running on my, uh, actually it's on the Raspberry Pi system. And I've got uh, the three on three connected right now, the BeagleBone, the QB truck, and the Raspberry Pi. Um, make sure I can get in. And so I have the three systems. Um, You'll notice a few things here. The first one is that if you have not seen Oak before, by the way, it is the web-based, right now it's PHP-based, um, 
management and monitoring tool for Informix. It's free. Uh, if you Google Open Admin Tool, uh, they have a full site for it. It's all PHP scripts, so it's completely expandable. It's a really nice tool. Um, so the first thing you may notice is the amount of free space is low. That's just because the disks are small on, on these, um, and specifically the partitions that have the Informix directories are low, or the Informix chunks are fairly full. Second is you notice the I.O. is marked red. On the Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone, it's saying the I.O. times are too long. This is because those two, they're running on SD, drive, SD chips. SD chips are pretty quick. They're not that quick. The QB truck, on the other hand, is just purely the um, IOs are in too few trunks. Again, these are test systems. I've only got, I think, four or five chunks on the on there. The IO for the QB truck is very nice because it's on a full SD drive, SSD drive. Um, again, these are just test systems. There's not a lot going on with them right now. Um, but I actually have set up a ER system between two of the boxes. Um, not really advanced, just it's replicating one table, but it's purely a you know, Unix 2 section is the Raspberry Pi, the Unix 1 group is the QB truck, and just has data replicating between the two. Um, so you actually see the two connected, and you can actually see the node information. You know, again, it's not much is going on, it's actually fairly quiet. Um, and going to the replicates. I will also mention this may be a little slow to using. It's actually not the um, not the systems themselves. Um, the switch I had been using on this uh, kind of went out on me yesterday, so I'm using an ancient uh, 10 base T switch right now, so the speed is not terribly good. Um, so you can actually see the you know the the systems together. You can see the um, environment right now. We're on the QB, I'm actually connected to the QB truck, so you see that, you know, it's two gigs total, not a lot is used, it's two CPUs. Um, right now we're on 12.1 uh, UC3. Again, these are on ARM7, so it's all 32-bit. Um, but the other part I want to bring up with OAT, because mentioning all the auto-tuning features, if you use OAT, they're all, most of them are in here as well. You can actually go in and tune your auto-update statistics. You can see how they're doing, how it's configured, um, shows you the current statistics, how all these are set up, and all these features you can do on the command line or in the um, through the utilities or through the SQL manager. But it's sometimes a little easier to see this way if you're not familiar with it. Um, same with the virtual processors allow you to add uh, the memory manager. This is where you can actually tune your low memory manager if you want to enable it. Um, so you can actually set where your thresholds are and actually it'll let you see exactly what it's doing. So there's quite a few things that will help you. You know, if you're not using OAT, I do recommend it. OAT is supported from version 10 on. Um, so most everyone I'm hoping that's running Informix back at the office could use it. I do really recommend it. If you've not tried it, check it out. There is a separate webcast for getting up and running on it. So the other piece, and this is my, you know, nothing up my sleeve. Um, I'll actually show you what it looks like. Oh, I get disconnected. I know you don't log in as root, but again, this is a test system. So, um, but so what I'm running here is the 12.1 UC3. This is on, um, this is, yeah, this is on my um, the QB truck. So again, it is a full a full version of Informix. Right now, I've got enterprise replication running. I could run HDR. I could run time series. I've got all of the features available to me. Um, you know, I've got full system set up. I'm actually going to pop over to the um, Raspberry Pi system. And what I've actually got here is, you know, what sen sensor data. This is not in time series. This was I just was doing it uh, remotely, but this was actually feeding sensor data directly into my Informix instance. Um, those timestamps were from a few months ago. Um, but it actually fed all the information, feeding it directly from the sensor to the Raspberry Pi and then into Informix directly. Um, so it goes through, and again, this is full-featured, full database, handled 
exactly the same, same command, same utilities, everything else that you're using on your big production, you know, AIX box or Linux box, or whatever it may be on these little systems. And again, this little system is just a Linux box. Uh, this one's running Debian, so I have all my apt get uh, features, I have all my configuration, everything I know and love about Linux, I've got here as well. That is why this is really such an interesting proposal, because all these tools, all these features, we all already know, all, all of us are already familiar with and already use, we can just move over here. Again, if you're running C code, you'll need to recompile it against the ARM environment, but none of it is hugely changing, and now you've got these little systems that are cheap, easy to replace, easy to maintain, you know, that you can put on, use your full-fledged Informix and whatever else you're running, and it'll all play nicely. And then you can then take that, turn it, and then expand upon it. Use the sensor data that you, you, know, you talked about last time, or, you know, use whatever kind of data feeds or whatever application or create a quadcopter off of it or whatever you want to do and then actually make a product, make something, and then go out there and make your fortune on it or make, you know, or do it because you love it and you just are happy with the thing that you produce. You know, it's not all about money, but sometimes it's nice when you get paid for what you love. And this is a case where if you're passionate about this sort of thing, you really can go make a product and do something with it. So I'm going to hop back up to – going to open it up now for any questions. I'm going to let Lester step in on that as well. Uh, he's the one managing these. Um, so yes, yes. Uh, uh, that's the best place. That's the best place to that ass ass down down using the chat. And uh, let me uh, reiterate because uh, Lester is breaking up there. Um, if you pull up the little chat window, um, you can directly send me a message. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to send them in, and I'll answer them. Um, if not, you can also feel free to e – or if you have questions later on or you're watching this in replay, you know, my email address is up on the screen right now, so do feel free to email in. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I didn't realize it was breaking up there. You are a bit – you got a little bit of a robot thing going on. Um, so. Um, one other thing I did not mention in the presentation, I will just have for the replay, um, or I'm mentioning now for the replay purposes. If you're not familiar with Informix, it does have another feature. We've had some other uh, articles on it in the past, but a feature called Time Series, which is fantastically optimized both for space and speed to get um, time-based data, whether that is measuring a temperature every 30 seconds or you're measuring your from your smart meter, it's pulling in whatever data on a you know, regular basis to actually store large quantities of data in a very compact way that then you can easily query uh, at very high speed. It's a fantastic uh, feature, and I don't know of any other uh, database engine that has one that is as efficient as that. Um, so I just mentioned it because a lot of times with the IoT pieces, this really does uh, play into it, and why that blue mix highlights uh, time series so much with Informix because it really is the best product out there for it. So are there any other questions? All right. Well, thank you all very much for being on. Um, I'm going to hop to the last slide here. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. I'm more than happy to answer any you may have. Um, and I'll ask a request here. If you're either if you watch this on replay or you're one of the people on listening right now, if you do anything cool with ARM and Informix, let me know. I want to hear what people are doing with it. I want to, you know, as much as you can say about it. I know, you know, many of us have NDAs here and there, but if you do something cool with it, you find some cool solution, you make some cool hobby project. Let me know. I'm really curious to see how creative people get. So thank you all again very much. Um, and if you missed part of this or you need to watch it again, we'll have it up in a couple of days on YouTube. Um, so thank you. Well, let me see. I think Lester got dropped off. So I need to. Uh... No, I'm right here. Okay. So, sorry. So do you pop off? <laughs> No, so uh, thank you all, and uh, with that, we'll end the webcast, unless you got anything more to add, Tom. That's it. Thank you all very much. Um, and, again, next uh, next month, the end of July,
be going over the intro to install. So even if you don't need it, you may have someone in the office that it's handy for. So feel free to pass that one along.